on you. Sure. Is anyone here the official host of the room? Yes, good afternoon. Hello. We are in charge of moderating this panel. So we are just waiting a few minutes and we are about to start. Perfect. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending on the, on the place and the world you are in. My name is Eugenia Carrion Canton, and I will be in charge of moderating this panel that I'm going to introduce in a minute, together with my colleague, Jorge Calvo. So we are really delighted to, to go through this experience of second day of the critical media literacy of the Americas Conference. And we are ready to introduce all the members of this panel that are presenting this great work that is uh, entitled Mindcrafting Pedagogies Towards a Community-Oriented, Critically Making Art Collective. So I will give the floor to my colleague to introduce all the authors to start this discussion and to know more about what you are doing. Thank you, Eugenia. Thank you, all of you. Welcome. Catherine Alexandra it is a practice-based researcher currently living in North Carolina. At present, their theoretical and artistic focus is on the performance of the sacred a material transformation, a social memory used to access the possibility of being a potential living archive that conceptualizes knowledge as practice. Alexandrite's work for Duke's Computational Media Arts and Culture program involves collaborations, installations, unionizing, collective organizing, and collage looking at contemporary techno technology and its relationship with information strategically removed from recognizable forms of affect and social beings. Kelsey Broad is an artist and writer currently working on her PhD in the Computational Media Arts and Culture Program at Duke University. Broad's video, performance, net projects, and prints explore contemporary social politics in and through technological phenomena. More recently, the work explores human machine reasoning and the various methodological boundaries drawn by data bias and mathematical limits. Broad research and writing have focused on early imaginations of internet by women, machine vision, and performance. Devian Gabriel is a second year digital art history MA student at Duke University, trained in digital humanistic methodologies. 
her academic work centers on art crime, art laws, and applications of emerging technologies to areas of art preservation, research, and education. Curran Karen is an experimental musician, media artist, and theorist working primarily with electronic and algorithmic media. His research is concerned with human improvisation and its influence in development of automated decision systems, particularly insofar as they manifest and reproduce hegemonic power and hierarchy. His work examines the relations and ideologies that inhere in the design of system processes and interfaces, and it's motivated by a concern with the operative and recursive nature of computational racial capital in postmodern so social technical assemblages. Current is a PhD candidate in computational media, arts, and cultures program at Duke University. And Kristen Thompson, uh, Thompson is a scholar in residence in the Department of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies at Duke University. Her academic work centers on post world poetry and science, contemporary poetics, conceptualism, and researching research. Her writing practice and public humanities work explore critical collaborative modes of imaginative world building. building. Let's welcome them all. Oh, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that in Durham on Duke University grounds, we work on the unceded land of the ancestral stewards, now known as the Eno, Shikori, Tuscarora peoples, who continue to live and work in the region today. And it would only be appropriate in a critical media literacy conference to acknowledge the labor and land exploited by technologies like Zoom and its servers, Microsoft and Minecraft software, and all of our computers. My name is Kelsey Broad, and I'm just going to pass it on for everyone to um, say their names since you can't see us on the Zoom screen. I'm Mark Olson. I'm Kate Alexandre. I'm Davian Gabriel. I'm Kristen Tapson. And I'm Ron Green. Uh, so we first thought we would give a little background on how this project came to be in the lab, because to work on a community oriented project, we had to radically expand our understanding of sensation for the lab. Um, we're a part of a larger lab called the Speculative Sensation Lab at Duke University, which has focused, uh, it's been an interdisciplinary humanities research lab um, that in the past has worked on technologies and ex expansion of sense and sensory experience. Um, and so in order to do the project that we are presenting today, we had to sort of um, rethink ourselves and expand our understanding of sensation to the lab as including the way we all related to one another in an academic environment and uh, in the community that it's situated in. Um, in the fall of 2019, the lab convened with multiple new members, many of whom expressed a desire to engage in critical making while feeling challenged to imagine a new technology that employed sense and sensation productively without reinforcing power dynamics that determine who has access to technology and how it is utilized towards economic manipulation and social control. Given this impasse, we wondered what then could we collaborate on besides theorizing technology? Some S1 members proposed that academia, especially in its more abstract preoccupations, was often isolated from practice that engaged knowledge in specific contexts of community. This became a driving question. How could or should we orient ourselves towards Durham? Can we practice theory in situ towards understanding our environs as influential, the community inherently operating with knowledge we could not only benefit from engaging, but which also resonates with what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney terms study as Fred Moten explained it. We are committed to the idea that study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. The notion of a rehearsal being in a kind of workshop, playing in a band, in a jam session, or old men sitting on a porch, or people working together in a factory. There are these various modes of activity, the point of calling it study is to mark 
that that incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities is already present. We ended up presenting the idea of doing nothing to folks at a, a co-working space in Research Triangle Park, eventually compensating them for doing not, nothing for an hour. Um, and this nothing was a sort of way for us to refuse the history of the lab. And this ended up um, eventually leading us to think of doing nothing as its own technology, but through its resistance to normative productivity, has the ability to open up sensation beyond normal perception. Moreover, taking seriously working on nothing, we denied ourselves any determination of the purpose of the lab or of nothing. If in the traditional banking system of pedagogy that Prairie describes where, quote, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing, end quote, we shifted ourselves to the other end of the banking system. We did not proclaim to know anything of nothing. During the pandemic, however, the grounds for how we could think of nothing changed and we found ourselves now able to return to the question of how can we as a university lab engaged in communal critical making when our already perceived isolation in academia had only been exacerbated by the cultural responses to COVID. We were all thinking of virtual education and a couple of us, Kristen and Karan, were now responsible for monitoring the virtual education of their children at home through a Zoom parent-teacher meeting at Pearson Town Elementary in Durham, Kristen ended up connecting with the school's parents of African-American children, or PAC organizers, who were excited about the potential to collaborate with our lab. Together with PAC, we explored the idea of critical media making, and after slacking and meeting over several months to establish shared values and desires, we began a project called Minecraft Block Party, where we invited students to engage in lessons that involved building a creature in Minecraft, learning how to use Minecraft's version of electricity to automate beams and lights, and modifying Minecraft avatars using an external software. It was an important, it was also important for us to scaffold free time. So in between each lesson, we had an open session where students could come into Minecraft and, and talk to us and just freely play. A source that was important, an important influence to our planning was the Alley Media Project's Building Consentful Tech zine that helped us build language around consent in digital bodies such as Minecraft avatars operating in a virtual space. With this, I'll pass it on to our Minecraft architect, Davian, who will lead us through the decisions she made while building the Minecraft world. All right, so before I even can begin to talk about the uh, thought process that went into creating uh, this space that we did our sessions and played in, I really want to highlight that there was a very long and involved process. Um, before we even put down the first block, we had lots of iterative processes where we had to figure out what the technical parameters were going to be for, um, you know, this project that we were going to do. For example, we initially thought that we might use uh, the Minecraft Java edition but as a you could host servers uh, with Minecraft Java edition and that would allow for these open play sessions so folks could come in and play whenever they wanted to. However, we learned that that wasn't going to be feasible and instead we used the Minecraft Education Edition, um, which while more friendly to the Pearson Town students also had its own limitations in that it could not host these servers um, and perpetually. So we had to figure out these workarounds um, and for one example, we had to have a computer here at Duke University always online and logged in in order to host the server so that we could actually facilitate some of the work that we were doing. So again, just want to highlight that, you know, before we even got to the first block here, there were just a lot of things that we had to troubleshoot, uh, that we had to think about, uh, that we had to compromise on to even get to the first play session. So this is the spawn point in the Minecraft world. And the spawn point is where when folks are entering into the world, the place that they will initially come, uh, that they will initially spawn into uh, in order to explore the world. And for this, I created a plaza with a panda on it as the panda was the mascot for Pearson Town. 
and it has the panda face, so welcome sign. And then you can also see some signs there on top of the panda face that have some of the rules that we went over in our first play session, uh, just as a sort of materially reminding students, you know, to respect each other, to respect folks' works, and if they have any issues to come to one of the Minecraft guides and they can help them out. The thought process here was to have something that in materially within this world, uh, something that was identifiable that you uh, that you could say that you're at the panda head, you're at the you know the center, and that you're able to actually navigate to it. Um, since uh, for this project, we knew that there would be varying skill levels for mobility and being able to navigate through Minecraft. Another thing I want to note is that you can see that there are some of these like openings on the sides of this plaza, and these are uh, eventually roads that we build into as the sessions continue on. We had these left open at first um, so that they could organically grow as we continue with the sessions and actually build out the world with the students. This is a view of the barn, which is um, one of the paths that lead to uh, this area here uh, within the world. This is after a few sessions, but this barn was something uh, that we built as sort of an obstacle course for students to be able to jump around in and actually be able to practice sort of the, the mechanical uh, movement within Minecraft. Since, as I mentioned before, there were varying skill levels, some folks had a lot of trouble being able to move around while others were just jumping all over and, and flying. And so this was sort of a place that, you know, we could call to and say that you can practice uh, actually moving within Minecraft here. I will also note that there is uh, at the top, there was a little surprise <laughs> that uh, if folks got to the end of the obstacle course, they could um, there would be a firework that comes out. So also like a reward of being able to play and complete this obstacle course. And then this is the path that leads from the spawn point to the barn that I was just talking about a little bit ago. And I mostly want to call to this to just show that this, you know, as well as that, you know, we had these thoughts of, you know, what would make this space welcoming? What would show that this, you know, we started out with like a flat world with nothing in it. What could we do to show that this world that they could, you know, build in it, that they could make it, you know, into their own, um, that this was a creative expression for us and that <laughs> there was, you know, I could, we could have built, you know, any number of different buildings or decorations in these areas, but we built uh, this area uh, as our own sort of creative expression. And it was sort of like the first building session we did. It was really, you know, as much as it was creating a space to start this project in, it was also um, a creative project for us. And with that, I will have it go over to Karan. Hi. So yeah, I'm, I'm Karan, a uh, uh, PhD student in, in CMAC, um, Computational Media Arts and Cultures. Um, and my my interest in the project was uh, really structured by a concern a concern with time and timing systems. Oh yeah, if you can play that, that'd be great. It's real fun. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a musician and, and programmer by by training, um, and, and I've done some tinkering with with you know electronics and circuits, and I got really interested in these in-game materials, um, you know, redstone and and note blocks, and, and essentially like redstone is is Minecraft's uh, power source, um, and and so it's you know right away we get to the like all of these analogies to the real world of like. Okay, so so how do we explain what redstone is? It's like electricity, and then what's electricity like? And we we're, we're like thinking in terms of like how water flows and, and that sort of that sort of stuff. And you know, like it, it took quite a lot to get from a place of right, like my my fascination with with kind of 
building in this way and, and being able to kind of like productively share it with uh, like a community of elementary schoolers. Um, so, you know, you know, in Minecraft, you can use this redstone to, to power things, but, you know, turn lamps on, open doors automatically, et cetera. Um, but the main use, as you saw in the video, is I, I was interested in, um, you know, when it receives energy, it, you know, the no block makes some sound. Um, and so, so in, in Minecraft, like the, the blocks um, are, are pitched in, in sort of like a 12 tone scale. Um, and so, you know, how do you how do you kind of reconcile uh, you know these concepts of, of of time and kind of like uh, automation automation and circuitry um, at the same time you're you're thinking about music and like um, how to maintain the difference between uh, the concept in game and the real world kind of reference um, and so you know the the problem that I kept coming back to is is are we are we learning how to do things in the virtual setting, or are we using that setting to learn about concepts that exist outside of it? Um, and then you know, invariably, it's both, right? Like, like you, you actually have to kind of like attend to the context that you're in, um, and and recognize that it's a specific context um, on, on many orders of magnitude, actually. And so, like that, you know, initially, like thinking through. Kind of like the pedagogy of that musical context, right? It, it, it introduced all these sort of like um, representational uh, sort of difficulties that we had to work through. Um, so, so for instance, like even though I, I had this goal of like, you know, how do we get everyone making music as soon as possible, right, in the space and like collaborating together and you know, you know, building building structures together in this kind of like improvisational way, um, you know. The, the no blocks, right? Like they rely on redstone, and that that sort of dictated, right? I have to I have to talk about flow and electricity first. I have to talk about some specific, like Minecraft specific, specific building techniques of of how do I, you know, the the blocks sit on top of different materials to make different sounds. Um, you know, covering you know, like Davian was talking about covering navigation and those sorts of things, um, and sort of basic building techniques. And then, you know, even then to sort of like achieve rhythm at all, you know, that introduced another, another kind of uh, item, right? Another sort of in-game item of like, you know, there's this item called the redstone repeater where, um, you know, similarly to like real world electronic components, like, right, if you put it in backwards, you break your circuit and it doesn't work and, you know, people get frustrated. So how to, how to work through those, those sort of ideas. Um, because uh, with, without it, you know, with, without that component, right, you know, you, you give the circuit some power and everything plays once and, and just stops and there's no kind of like, uh, there's no, there's really no temporality to it. Um, so, you know, the, the other issue is like uh, making, right, making those loops that you saw in the, the clip um, is that like, Really having a good sense of like, uh, as I mentioned, flow and direction, and and the idea that um, right there there are certain kind of like affordances to the medium, and like there's a need to sort of like I don't know to to, to help the student understand that you know you don't you don't have to do it exactly the way that I demonstrated right you can take a path and kind of like. Turn it, turn it different different directions, um, but that at the same time there are sort of this like absolute constraints of the medium, right? So it, so it's like you you're you're able to sort of express um, express in a way that is that is infinite, but but still sort of like there there's still real constraints on on even that sort of infinity. Um, so. Yeah. Um, well, one uh, one specific sort of question of of, of like temporality that, they, that that came up for me too was like early on, sort of in the in the sort of speculation stage before we started planning this project. Um, like, you know, there there's a moment there's a moment there where you have to sort of uh, activate just a really sort of short energy pulse, 
um, to get it going around the loop, right? Uh, otherwise, the whole loop just fills up and everything stays in its on state and it can't it can't be activated again. So you can't get a, a repetition or a, or a loop without a really kind of like short pulse of energy. And you know, at, at the beginning, the only way I know I knew how to do this was to like you know put down a torch and and destroy it really quickly. And you know, I was doing it on like on like a, a gaming mouse, like 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 this. And one of our one of our colleagues early on um, just couldn't do it, and and I I didn't have any sort of like access or experience as to why, right? And um, you know, the person got really really frustrated, and I think like got got pretty soured on on Minecraft in general. <laughs> it was only like it was like maybe I don't know a month later that that I found out that, that they were using like, they were using an iPad, right? They didn't have, they didn't have like mouse buttons. And, and so the kind of speed of a click, um, it's just like, it's not, it's not part of like double clicking or, or clicking multiple buttons like with a, a game controller or a, or a precision mouse is just not a part of the sort of interface vernacular of, of an iPad. Um, and so it, it was like, it was like this, the situation where, where, what they were being asked to do was was pretty much impossible in terms of like you know physics and time. Um, and so you know we we came up with 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 solutions to that. Like you know, Davian found a solution where right like physical dexterity was was no longer part of getting this thing going. Um, and, and we even right we we bought gaming mice and delivered them to you know every student that, that participated um, to kind of like you know work through work through these kind of uh, these kind of slippages and access um, and then you know finally you know even once right you know once we get to a, you know a basic understanding of, of circuits and the ways you know, there's still a problem of kind of like simultaneity and, and space and kind of like, you know, figuring out like how far, how far apart do, do these circuits need to be so that they're not interfering with each other. So, so the student can hear what they are trying to work on. Um, you know, otherwise, otherwise it's like, you know, either, either a much longer and more detailed kind of like curriculum and musical harmony and you know, how do you play together in this context? Um, or just like an acceptance of cacophony, um, cacophony and kind of like a, a lack of intelligibility of like what, what the student themselves is doing and affecting. Um, and, you know, I'm okay with the former, but, but not the latter, you know, in that case. Um, and then, then finally, like, I, just to wrap up, like, so, so Minecraft is, you know, there's a global clock that sort of constrains all of this activity. So we're, we're thinking about right the musical clock, and then we're thinking about the game clock, the the the, the system clock. And so you know that's set to you know 20, 20 frames per second by default, but it might move more slowly or quickly based on you know the capacity of the the individual computer. You know. Um, so it can run faster with more powerful and more expensive hardware. Um, and then, you know, more affordable devices might struggle to run at that target rate. Uh, and so this is like more of a general problem with computation and digital access and, and you know, obsolescence, but it, it's really exasperated when we take it into a pedagogical context. Um, so, you know, we had the idea that, that you know, we're going to run this on, on low cost Chromebooks. Um, and, and so, you know, in this, the broader sort of social sense, you know, there's a struggle over, you know, processor speed. You know, there's like uh, competitive online gaming that, that's really kind of so tied to like celebrity and profit. Um, you know, we see like esports even coming into academic settings where it's like you can, you can get a scholarship to be like an e-athlete. Um, and, and so like, you know, connection stability, processor speed, monitor refresh rates, you know, all of this kind of like correlate to competitive advantage. Um, 
And so, you know, even though we're not, we're not in that same sort of competitive context, it, it also translates to like a seamlessness of experience um, and, and like, a, like a quality of access. And, and a lot of times like, uh, so, so I, you know, I have a five-year-old daughter and like a lot of times, especially during the pandemic when we're, we're, we're on a video chat with, with either of her grandmothers, right? Um, I noticed that she she really kind of like seems to attribute any sort of instability into the connection to like them personally. Um, and so we're working on defaulting to not like to defaulting to I think we got a bad connection rather than like grandma, you're blurry, you know? Um, we, you know, like when we say uh, you're breaking up in the kind of like vernacular. We do so with like the, there's an understanding that it's a problem of materiality of like networks and traffic and cost. Uh, but but uh, yeah, what I've been thinking about a lot with this project, like at what point does that vernacular becomes become naturalized, right? And and just part of like uh, our own subjectivity, how we think about ourselves or how we think about others. Um, and then so yeah, how do we how do we avoid sort of like internalizing in, 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 uh, infrastructural differences like, I don't know, personal personal failing or shortcoming or something like that. Um, and how do we sort of imagine alternatives to kind of like this, that, that kind of trajectory? Other than to just buy more bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the things that we should just make clear is the reason why we didn't understand that one of our lab members and then navigate in Minecraft is because we were all on Zoom. So we were balancing like, uh, you know, at least two softwares at a time. Um, uh, and so one of the things that I was figuring out through our Minecraft Black Party project is like, how do we assess the different forms of feedback that we're receiving on both applications? Um, because they have four different uh, forms of feedback. Um, so I'm gonna go a little more formal and um, read something. Uh, located on the lower left hand of the Zoom interface, the mute button is represented by an icon of a mic with a red flash over it. In most situations, a person enters a Zoom call muted and must click the mute button in order to unmute themselves. This muted default drastically reduces recognizable forms of presenter feedback, whether it be a short collective response such as a laugh or the ability for individuals to provide verbal responses in quick succession without thinking about unmuting. And I should note, we have absolutely no feedback right now because yeah. we're sharing our screen so we can't see everyone right now. Um, however, the mute as default also prevents too much feedback from entering the Zoom call, whether that is presumed unwanted background sounds or a dreaded feedback loop between microphone and speaker. It might seem then that Zoom calls present two options, either too much or too little feedback. But what if instead of framing it as too much or too little, Zoom presents alternative forms of feedback to which we are not yet attuned? During one of our lessons in Minecraft, many of the students did not provide verbal feedback over Zoom, but instead acknowledged what had been said by their actions and movement in the Minecraft world. How might working in tandem with the two softwares acknowledge recognizable modes of feedback on one software, while at the same time validate previously unrecognizable forms of feedback on another? What I would like to propose is that critical media literacy can be a practice of multiple forms of literacy, which may or may not be fully legible or always in a shared form of understanding. I'm wondering how might we expand dialogue beyond recognizable forms of literacy or in Freire's words, name the world together beyond common language. Can we name the world through critical making, but one that is not necessarily always operating with a full shared legibility? I'll start with an example from one of our Minecraft block party sessions. Uh, during a demonstration on how to play with making rhythm in Minecraft, as Fran just demonstrated, it was necessary that students use particular building materials. And if you can go to the slide that demonstrates that. Like The goal um, 
So this was our most technical tutorial, and it sometimes required specific instructions, such as press E to access your inventory. On this day, I worked with three students, including two siblings in the same household. Because they lived together, and uh, they were often sitting next to each other, their mics and speakers would enter into a feedback loop if both of the mics were on. One would leave the computer muted, and the other, who was very skilled at Minecraft, would leave theirs on, although they would often be narrating what they're doing on their own little like, Minecraft journey. I ended up feeling frustrated by not knowing whether they could hear me because there was no recognizable response in Zoom. And it wasn't until I checked Minecraft, as examples here, um, that I could see that they were actually holding the thing. Um, and I could tell them that they were understanding the prompt. Um, so I felt relieved to have the second software with the more obvious form of feedback, one that visualized the thing as um, asking, but then I started to wonder why I felt so disconcerted by the perceived lack of response in Zoom. After all, by that point, the students were new Zoom and knew how to unmute themselves or say something in the chat. Maybe the fact that they did not ask for help or verbally affirm that the directions were received or was also a form of feedback in itself. To be clear, I'm not thinking of this as an absence of a response or a lack of response, but rather intentional silence as a present response, one that indicates a form of already listening, thinking, and doing. Um, although Minecraft provides visual feedback, Minecraft does not allow for auditory feedback. There's a chat function, but toggling to the chat clumsily disables the ability to navigate. As such, Minecraft pedagogy becomes a kind of choreography of demonstration along with a few chat messages until the student or user who is learning something feels satisfied enough that they can go off and do it on their own. When they do go off to make something on their own, they definitely do not just mimic what was done in the tutorial. They'll often improvise and do their own thing that demonstrates the same type of action reflection very requires the dialogical feedback, but through making. And so here um, we had a student who wanted to learn how to build a pond and um, put some fish in it. And I think ultimately ended up fishing from the <laughs> pond. Um, so this was us figuring it out together. And then here, that's him, uh, yeah, making his little, his pond. And so then, and then he made the jump himself that he was able to fish it. As another example, in the first Minecraft block party session, we asked students to build creatures using Minecraft materials for the first time. I borrowed the lesson plan from the Minecraft Education Edition website, originally under the title Design an Animal. We made the decision to say creature instead of animal because we did not want to restrict what the Minecraft being could be. At the end of the session, we had a show and tell where students could bring us to their creature and describe what it was they built. While some stuck to a certain uh, animal taxonomy, they certainly did not adhere to any strict understanding of the animal. <laughs> For example, one student made a creature standing in a pool of water that she referred to as a llama. But why is the llama standing in the pool of water and why is the llama made of hay? Thinking back, I, we didn't have time to ask these questions, but I'm glad that we didn't. I don't necessarily always want to know why the llama is made of hay unless they want to present me with that information. Um, because through critical making, I sometimes want to reserve that logic for them to have. As um, Edward Glissant uh, uh, defines opacity, the opaque is not the obscure, though it is possible for it to be so and be accepted as such. It is that which we can that cannot be reduced, which is the most perennial guarantee of participation and conflict. Through the inability to be reduced to language, critical making demands the students' active participation, most importantly, our participation with the world in order to make it understandable to them, from which they can choose to share through language or by demonstration to others. And as my colleague Kristen Tapson will argue, Minecraft setup is one of making mine, of building a world of one's own or sharing with others. What then is this non-discursive form of feedback in which language does not always enter the realm of making or naming the world? Thank you, Chelsea. When we began working on this project, we didn't start with Minecraft. We started more broadly with the desire to generate a community art practice and to work with students in a program that would be compatible with school Chromebooks. Over time, we began working together in, in a collective model that foregrounds practices of radical pedagogy. 
We approach Minecraft with an awareness of the implicit and explicit technological constraints related to the game, as well as the potential difficulty of running the program alongside Zoom on the Chromebooks. As Kelsey vividly illustrated, the challenges that emerged from unclear communication on Zoom sometimes presented opportunities to notice modes of non-discursive feedback already happening, but only identified through facilitator attentiveness during the events themselves. What emerged across our work in the education edition of Minecraft, more specifically, was the need to resolve our general pedagogical model, if implicitly, against the one presented by Microsoft. The education edition of Minecraft proposes a set of principles that are broadly useful to us. It foregrounds students learning from other students. It scaffolds a space where the teachers will learn how to maneuver in Minecraft from students. It enables kinesthetic modes of learning and open exploration, and the lessons often invite students to write reflections on their experience at the end. Considered at finer granularity though, Minecraft education is largely oriented toward teaching real world concepts in the space of Minecraft, including topics from math and science, to social and emotional wellness, rather than concomitantly inviting students to explore something like digital materiality through Minecraft, for example, as we wanted to do. The logic of Microsoft's education edition of Minecraft is something like hiding the vegetables and something kids like to eat. Kids like Minecraft, so kids will enjoy learning bits of school curriculum in the game. The openness promised in Microsoft's lessons can be negated in practice too, especially when students do the lessons by themselves. One social and emotional learning quest called the Mindful Night, for example, takes the student through the process of collecting Minecraft armor and learning mindfulness techniques en route to meet an ender dragon, the final boss in the survival mode of the game, who must be pleased by the creation the student builds. This remaking of the survival quest as a creative quest ends the same way no matter what the student builds. The dragon is displeased, it takes the student's armor, and the student ostensibly thinks they have lost. If the student moves outside of the temple of the dragon, which is not an intuitive move, however, confetti falls and the celebration ensues. The student who is supposed to use the mindfulness tools to deal with the unpleasable dragon wins by learning mindfulness skills and dealing with losing their armor in a cheat. This lesson is an extreme example in the way it privileges the lesson over the student's experience while breaking the logic of gameplay itself. But it illustrates perhaps the room for conceptualizing alternative education editions of Minecraft, especially those that prioritize playfulness in its most social forms at the particularly urgent moment when we began working together on this project. Writing on the topic of the ambiguity of games in the book, The Gameful World, tech designer and researcher, Sebastian Detterding, nuances the range of meanings of play in game studies and gamification discourse, calling games ultimately, quote, the material for and solidify remains of play. If there is a genre of games conducive to play at all, he writes, spotlighting the irreverent special kind of gameplay that implicitly teaches playfulness as, quote, a non-instrumental autotelic stance, then, quote, it is the most toy-like open-ended sandbox simulation such as Minecraft. It is certainly not a given that Minecraft scaffolds playfulness, but our project is suggestive of the possibilities of careful and consentful approaches to shaping digital community art spaces. Some of the key features of our approach include setting small scale objectives in the context of a live interactive space over several sessions, committing to play as an end in itself while understanding learning to be emergent within that play, and maintaining high facilitator to student ratios to foreground the kind of relationship building and manageable social situations that can nurture the kind of attentiveness Kelsey noted. Putting this project in the context of Frary's pedagogy then, one question that emerges is how and whether making local shared tech spaces within the model of arts education can be a mode of generating what Donaldo Macedo calls pedagogical conditions that will apprentice students into a new body of knowledge in the introduction to pedagogy of the oppressed, where the emphasis is less on naming the new body of knowledge and more on the instantiation of pedagogical conditions. Looking at the process through which we've been instantiating these conditions, the justice-oriented goals of the project have operated across scales, showing the importance of attentiveness and action in situ and pushing aside the idea that optimal conditions can be entirely put in place ahead of time. The work is in the work, the project keeps saying. For example, when parents have shared that they want their child to participate in the program but do not have inter an internet hotspot at the second location where their child will be on that particular evening, like a family member's home, our community partners taken on the work of addressing these issues on a case-by-case -case basis, 
making the project accessible to scale of the individual while also using a mode of navigating the school systems, the school systems layers of bureaucracy that we've developed together. And that has the potential to be impactful at larger, larger scales of decision making. This project is situated as very much in the thick of the COVID induced technologization of youth education and scaffolding this play space keeps producing new ways to practically engage with structural inequities. Elsewhere, but relatedly, I've been exploring the concept of mine and mining, intrigued by models that verb the possessive pronoun across 20th century poetry and science fiction. They're closely tied to the craft of writing and its material conditions, including pen to paper, as well as typewriter ink to page. This interest is not unrelated to the project of ungrounding the model of pedagogy implicit in the education of Minecraft and putting a site-specific pedagogical model in its place. As we've together thought about the ways technology shape cultural, technical, collaborative, and expressive knowledges and the hard one push to stabilize and institute alternatives, I think often of the poet Amiri Baraka's 1971 essay, Technology and Ethos, in which he denies white Western technocracy with a techno-utopian proposal for a fully embodied, quote, expression scriber, an alternative to the typewriter, quote, into which I could step and sit or sprawl or hang and use not only my fingers to make words, express feelings, but elbows, feet, head behind. That is to push paradoxically for a horizon of non-instrumentalizing instruments of expression is something like pushing for the alternative etymology of mining. They can, I think, be an armature for a generous and generative form of playfulness to stand in contrast to the form of mining for limited resources and the survival mode of Minecraft that otherwise necessarily precedes craft. To mine might mean to put into play, and it might operate on a scale beyond the individual. It might mean bringing oneself into the tensions and forces within the space one creates as individual facilitator with another facilitator or all together as a group, for example, in a digital community space we are trying to scaffold. Uh, and so next, uh, Mark Olson will elaborate on the challenges of establishing the interinstitutional groundwork for this project and instituting it from positions within Duke. So uh, as I, I hope you uh, have, have gleaned from the presentation so far, you know, while we're cited in a university, we're attempting to uh, reproduce some of the more problematic logics of the university kind of drive-by collaborative partnership is not what we're after. We're interested to build authentic uh, um, collaboration, sustain collaboration with our community partners uh, through the work of as Debbie and said again before we lay you know, single blocks. Um, we've also, as Grant pointed and others have pointed out, tried to foreground the expertise and knowledge of the kids participating in the program and avoid that banking model of education that's not very one-way transfer of knowledge from institution to student. And we've also had an ethos of, of research refusal. Uh, we're a lab, but we uh, also know that in our engagement with the community, that's not the uh, mode in which we want to uh, be functioning as a, as a lab, kind of treating the community as a subject of university study by which we might extract some knowledge. Uh, so in, we've been in relation with our institutions throughout, and today I want to uh, briefly narrate some of how some of how of our efforts to scaffold the horizontality of critical pedagogy is rubbing up against the verticality of our institutional institutions' historic relationships to the community. We have been, for better or worse, grounded in our academic institution. It emerges from our creative and intellectual labor as a university research collective and is productively leveraging the resources of our institution, its printing facilities, its computational resources, its employee time channeling them outward, outwardly in ways that we hope further a situated radical politics that we took in the climate. Studying it within the institution has also entangled it in the institution's framework for engaging with youth in the community. In particular, it, is, it has required that the project be vetted by our university's minors in Duke programs, policies, and procedures, rendering it scrutable by some of the highest administrative authorities at our institution, the dean, the provost, the office of corporate risk management. Many of these policies and requirements, of course, deeply align with the politics and ethics of the project and its members. For example, ensuring that all participants are aware of the alarming prevalence of the sexual abuse of children, and that we're all taking active steps to structure programs and interactions in order to minimize the conditions that enable such abuse to be perpetuated. At the same time, the nature of the uh, release forms 
that the institution requires of all parents and youth, that all parents and youth participants sign, perpetuate some of the asymmetries that we see as fundamentally inimical to a kind of radical pedagogy. For example, consider the rhetorical force of the participation agreements, uh, 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 agreements liability release. It requires that parents acknowledge the risks, quote, inherent of the online setting, such as, but not limited to, the risks of data mining, phishing, viruses, malware, data breach of online information, cyberbullying, exploitation, victimization, cyberstalking, online grooming, cyber predators, and image uh, replication, end quote. Parents have to acknowledge those. Um, but then at the same time, parents also have to assume liability uh, for those risks, um, seeking from the parents almost global absolution of the institution from the actions of the program participants, whether to could release their kids that may cause any harm. So also included in this document is an assumption of risk uh, clause that requires that the parent and legal guardian agrees to accept, quote, and assume all present and future risks, known or unknown, and whether described in the program description or not, to privacy, property, or the participant's health or safety. And moreover, the parent, the parent agrees to uh, explain these risks, again, known or unknown, uh, to their children uh, as participants in the program. And finally, then, uh, to release, waive, discharge, and this is all in caps, and covenant not to sue Duke University as affiliated trustees, employees, uh, et cetera. I think there's more. Uh, so, I'm, you know, it, this, of course, you know, is inimical to our, our project in many ways of wanting to establish horizontal. Um, we, we have a, a, a great deal of, of inequity here in terms of who gets to assume risk, who's assuming risk, who. Um, and any attempts that um, we've had so far to fold in more symmetrical and explicit enumeration of the things that we've done, for example, to mitigate these risks, all of our participants have produced the background texts. Uh, we came explicitly to produce a safe space. We didn't went through all of the requisite training. Uh, but all of our attempts to articulate that in the document as a way to say the institution, we and the institution are making good faith efforts to mitigate these risks. Uh, were denied the inclusion in the document. Instead, um, we were told that the institution could not make such warranties uh, with participants or their parents. Similarly, um, while we have no intention of photographing or producing recordings of the children themselves during our Zoom sessions, in fact, the policies for minors and new programs explicitly pro prohibit these practices, <clears throat> the participant agreement nonetheless asks that parent and leave guardian give permission and consent or to allow photographs and video and audio recordings to be taken of the participant during the program, and that uh, giving the, uh, give permission that these photographs, audio, or video recordings um, may be uh, uh, used in website publications and other things in uh, perpetuity. So when I asked why this was included in, in spite of the policies, again, we're not, not intending to, nor are we allowed to do these recordings. I learned that this is essentially an institutional preemptive, right? According to our liaison with the program office, quote, this language is intentionally left in to cover situations where recordings are inadvertently collected. Here, participant safety means corporate risk management in ways that uh, strongly foreclose on what might be called the juridical horizontality, uh, but I would also argue to the Especially problematic in, in the context of our project is the way in which the uh, agreement stakes a claim on the creative work produced by the program as well. Uh, they also, parents also agree that the writings and other participant work produced by the program uh, may be used by Duke in all perpetuity. So when pressed, uh, when I pressed for more positively, uh, more positively assert the intellectual claim of the students over their creative work as well as their property. The legacy of property law, perhaps granting Duke instead a limited and non exclusive license to recreate the work. The response was simply that our quote, our standard language does not consider that monitors would own their work product for photos, including their own license. This is an area where we would not be able to make substantive changes. This is the standard release language. And instead, what was offered was the uh, option to, to opt out. Um, but of course, that was never de yoked from our ability to. Published in the foreground, the student's work, which is precisely the focus of the program. So, in other words, you know, the institution in this in terms of this agreement will scaffold 
creativity and enable the space to kind of critical pedagogy, but only if we can be freely extractive of it as well as uh, maintain a highly asymmetrical um, relationship in burden of risk. I'll be honest and admit that these barriers and this asymmetry that at times maybe feel like we should perhaps abandon the project as pursuing it in the name of our institution required that we compromise it in significant ways. At the same time, I think we've seen this as an opportunity. And as Kristen recently spoke of the ways in which this, these frictions have laid bare uh, issues that we can then take up with, with the public schools, our partners can take up with the public schools. I also think that, uh, that this has also given us, as agents of the institution, whatever kinds of agency we might have, it certainly rendered visible all the structures and practices um, that were flows on democratic learning as we engage with, engage with the public. So for me, at least, the experience compels um, me to leverage whatever voice I do have to critically appraise and reimagine the space of university community partnerships for teaching here, uh, a kind of different form of, of Minecraft. Uh, so I wanted to point out in, in the ways in which this is deeply cited with an institution and, and building up some of those frictions. Um, but I also want, I think we want to end on a more positive uh, note. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Kate Alexander. I just kind of speak about a different set of frictions that uh, might instigate some more positive life. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, or friction thick. Yes, I'll, I'll say the, the way that I titled this, which funnily enough got mistitled, this was um, Minecraft is where we learned to burn it down and somebody retitled it Minecraft is where we learned to build it down. So we'll see where we end up. Um, and I'm going to start with a quote from Freire uh, from the first chapter of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. In order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation which they can transform. The same is true with respect to the individual oppressor as a person. Discovering himself to be an oppressor may cause considerable anguish, but it does not necessarily lead to solidarity with the oppressed. If what characterizes the oppressed is their subordination to the consciousness of their master, as Hegel affirms, true solidarity with the oppressed means fighting at their side to transform the objective reality, which has made them these beings for another. Um, and I'll say it may seem fraught to use this incredible passage by Freire to contextualize a collaborative project to facilitate playing the popular computer game Minecraft with elementary school children. But even as researchers, I don't know that we could have foreseen how transformative this collaboration would be outside of the game or even the space of planning the play, especially for ourselves. Beyond the technological challenges and the mindful development and orchestration of lessons and platforms to facilitate the critical making, to design and publish a zine that made the material link between ourselves and the virtual students, the most radical element of the project may have been in the incessant creation of portals and new grounds of solidarity that were built to find ways around the doors and the servers that were unknowingly before we took on this research, close to each other in the institutional world in which we operated. Um, by connecting as a lab whom for PAC represented Duke as an institution, many of us became aware that our desire for collaboration and interaction in the community was a commitment that required us to risk by association and alignment with Duke, potentially over promising what access and resources we wielded in reality. Um, power in this way was repeatedly and uncomfortably made legible, and it's a strange shifting between Duke and the Durham schools and even to Microsoft and Minecraft was a mapping of our own sandbox world that without having attempted this collaboration may not have been revealed um, may not have revealed the multitude of limits we had previously operated around without challenge. Um, by putting into practice our desire to work in the community, to enact our commitment to critical making, and by having to build a previously non-existent infrastructure through which this could come into being, which I think we've all spoken on, together with PAC, we managed to map anew the range and reach of Duke, the public school system, the space of Zoom, and ultimately, and perhaps most rewardingly, facilitate a potential to experience transforming a world. The playing collectively with the students in Minecraft was felt, at least by myself and I think many others, um, almost as a reward of the world building we had done outside to connect. The play was also to have leveled up finally into the virtual world of together. The education version of Minecraft as a sandbox game creates an interesting tension between 
the ability to build in the virtual world and the forced extractive vision encourages the player to adapt. And I think um, Christian, you spoke on this well. Um, and I'll just say one might see the possibility of playing the game as a way to accentuate the boundaries of one agency in a space that is expansive and in certain modes endlessly undeveloped. But while there is space for building collectively, it's hardly what one might imagine is the ideal space to explore a new consideration for defining liberation. While in certain modes, the game provides the tools outside of language alone to create the possibility for inquiry and understanding of, despite the virtual platform, almost a material sense of one's positional limits as imposed by the moderator, like the game moderator, while still providing tools for changing the world they're visiting. The lab's collaboration with PAC just as surprisingly began to interrogate how infrastructures and bureaucracy create the possibility for understanding the limits we accept in our social sphere without testing them mirrored by the limits of the game and no more visible than the limits the students had to test in order to identify what danger or destruction was allowed in the world by facilitators. We dedicated extensive effort and sometimes struggled to find convenient forms of communication, how to organize meaning, and then how to begin to unravel the maze of permissions that would allow us to integrate into one Minecraft world. Duke had licenses for Minecraft and wanted to host uh, Davian's book to this, but students would not be able to play on our servers because their login would be require a Duke email. The same was true in reverse. Licensing and hosting became the main focus of realizing the project in the first months. Um, and we were unaware of the limits that Microsoft, who owned the education edition of Minecraft installed on Chromebooks, automatically enforced who could con coexist virtually in their domain. Um, the Durham Public School IT staff, or public schools, yeah, IT staff were solicited and they were the ones that found a solution for us to be identified, made visible in their system. Once this gate was unlocked, however, the reality of other technological disparities was revealed. Hosting worlds on the Duke server was far more reliable than the schools. Students who had their own computers and not Chromebooks provided by schools were the only ones who could participate with sound and who had a better chance of making it into the game. Um, the horror, this is where you can go to the slide with like the chat of the, from the, the screenshot. The horror of the audio and the picture that Chromebook students were subjected to was viscerally interruptive. And yet somehow we did make it into a world together and we built and made music and made long green walls with no apparent purpose. The technological limits were there, but as researchers, their exposure was also the map of where we could find solidarity to name the urgent need for continued advocacy and research into the disparity of connection, perception, audio, and perhaps more importantly, Name the ways institutional barriers to radical pedagogy are enforced by technological walls far more invisible than those may, that may have segregated us in the past. Radical solidarity requires a practice and thought. And though there is no way to win in creative mode on Minecraft, I think we all felt something had been achieved in our small world worth celebrating. In fact, in the final session, we removed certain software limits that were play, placed on the game in order to put on a virtual firework show. So much like the firework in the beginning, we wanted to have a firework show. And student players quickly discovered that they finally had fire in the world. And so they used it to burn it down. <laughs> could, you, could, could you round it up in about a minute? So we have time to share some questions from the audience. Welcome to that. Yeah, yeah. This is where we were ending. Oh, how 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 nice. I, I, I was really amazed about the complexity of the problem solving layers deployed in your in, in your project. And uh, of course this um, uh, feel free to ask any questions to the, the to the panel, but uh, the, the, the first thought that came to my mind it has to do with that, with problem solving, different layers, or how to, how difficult, or what would be the challenge to, uh, the the challenge to, challenge to to scale it, yes, to different type of audiences, to different type of educational uh, levels, and um, and how complex is a multidisciplinary project you you deployed here? So uh, how hard or how easy that could be to transfer the, the project and you all, all that expertise to some other context and, and users. So it, it's very difficult. Um, I can say that we are aiming to uh, seek collaboration and uh, 
open source all of the work that we've done. So we're in the process of putting together a, a website uh, that will be at pandablackparty.org. We just purchased mm -hmm. the domain name uh, last week. Uh, and our goal is to put all of this material um, and the zines, uh, our approaches, uh, some of our reflections uh, about the difficulties of doing this, as well as the possibilities of doing this uh, on our website. Uh, we have expanded within our institution to bring on some additional Minecraft guides, some undergraduates. Uh, but again, keeping the ethos of the project sustained in that way has been difficult. Um, and I think um, you know, we have we imagine that this can take multiple iterations. Always, we hope situated within particular communities uh, and particular um, questions. But that the model we have, um, we'd like to share. Yeah, thank you. And anybody within the within the the room that can pose a question to the panel, be please feel free to open up your mics. Well, well, in the meantime, I was just thinking. thinking. I, I was uh, just thinking about the uh customization let's say of the um, yeah the regulatory uh guidelines yes uh, i i was in fact wondering uh how how hard would be to adapt yes regulations to different countries yes you very well uh, talked about uh, i don't know privacy uh, li li yes liabilities the the data protection so the the use of the the project are, or involving projects like that in in countries such as ours yes countries of latin america that would require a whole new vision on the regulatory um, uh, label yes and that, that, that could bring uh, a real um, yeah real challenge to communities and educational communities in fact yeah i think absolutely and we always try and bring like those material realities difficulties into the into the work itself and at, at some point we realized that duke was a minecraft in its own way allowing us to navigate uh, in in as Kron said infinitely but even on infinity you have some restrictions um and so i th i think we would be I think it would be a different project in a different place. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, also, yeah. I mean, I would, I would also add that, like, a lot of times, right? Like, you, you, you find the limits through practice, and not the other way around, right? And so, you know, I, I think in a lot of contexts, especially in, in this, this sort of context, it's like, like there, there aren't regulations and so it's up to people who have an ethics to like kind of, kind of like make those paths thank you very much okay. yeah thank you so much thank you thank you very much it was a great project i think that we we keep thinking about the the, the importance of using um different medium and technology in order to reflect and to work on on social practices so thank you very much and well, you're all invited to in, to go on and join right, all the presentations in this second day of the critical media literacy of the Americas Conference. Thank you so much. Yes, you thanks, for thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.